So, um, hey, good to see everybody here this morning. Happy Memorial Day. I hope uh, uh, you're having a good weekend, uh, enjoying uh, the day off. I know it's big, uh, it's a big holiday, and uh, a lot of people are, are doing stuff and traveling, so uh, thank you, everyone, for being here this morning. Uh, we're excited um, uh, just to be together. I'm, I've really been looking forward uh, to today in, in the message today. Um, for those of you visiting with us, my name is Bill. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you, uh, the pastor here would love the opportunity to meet you just outside the door. There's connections uh, table. Jessica will be out there, and she would love to connect with you, meet with you. We have a gift uh, for you as well, and, and I'd like to meet you as well. So I want to say hello to those of you watching online, whenever, wherever you're watching. There you go. I uh, hope that you're uh, comfortable uh, and enjoy uh, the service this morning. So I, uh, about 2019, matter of fact, this picture, show up this picture here. Um, I found this out like just a few minutes ago. This picture was actually almost five years ago to the day. It was like two days difference. It was in May. Um, and uh, that is uh, Sunshine Night's boys. Uh, Ryan was five years ago from today, so he's five years younger in that picture um, than he is today. So is Jordan. He's five years younger. So Jordan must have been seven. So, um, uh, but anyways, that's in Williamsburg, uh, Virginia, a national park out there. And so um, we were out there visiting the park, and, you know, it was really cool just to see, you know, um, all, all the, the historical stuff out there. But when we, uh, if you go back up to that picture, we're going to have it up there for a minute. So um, that's a, 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 a believe park ranger. So they had to go through these, um, they gave out like junior park ranger things. And so, you know, they had to go through like these, like a test. It was like really intense. And um, like, like 0.03% people ever achieved the junior park ranger thing. So it was pretty good. It was pretty important uh, achievement. No but, um, no, but they just, you know, he just did a little thing with them. And so that picture is uh is him like saying okay you are now a junior park ranger and i think he gave him a badge or whatever and i love this picture i don't know if it, it's not zoomed in um enough right now but i love the fa- looks look on their faces because it, it's they're just so in awe right i mean i mean they're like he, he says okay put your right hand up and they put the right hand up and they're like you know it's like a big deal i mean you could just see it on their face like they feel like something's happening like something big deal and uh, th- that's the impact of honor. Th- th- that's what happens when people are honored. The-, the-, the impact, the transformative power when you and I honor one another. Now, obviously, they were, you know, achieving something or at least they, they did something. But, man, I just love to, want to-, to look at this picture and see their faces. Like, man, there's something inside of us that, they- that we want to, to be honored. We- we- there- there's something that we are wired with, like, to, to be esteemed, to be honored, to be recognized. And um, uh, again, I, I love that picture. Uh, the challenging thing for us is that we actually um, look at honor most of the time as something that you do when someone has done something, like they've achieved something. So there's honor roll, like in school. Um, so people make all A's, they make honor roll. I mean, apparently that's what I heard. And so um, they make it on the honor roll, like, right? They, they make good grades. And so th- there's that. There's the honorable mention. Maybe you did something, you didn't kind of make the you know, get whatever award, but you're like, hey, well, honorable mention, these are honorable mention people, right? So there's something about honor, and we often look at honor as something that, um, that we give to somebody because they earned it, but we're going to see this morning that honor is something that we give, not earn. When you and I look at biblical, with the, the biblical definition of honor, honor is something you and I give, not something that we earn. Matter of fact, the Bible actually calls us to honor. Um, Look at what it says in here, Romans 12, 10. Um, It says, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I I don't know if you ever read that verse before, but it's like, it's kind of a competition. He's like, look, outdo one another. Like, he's he's calling people and charging people. Like, man, you guys should be honoring people more than the other person. Like, you should want to be honoring people more than other people are honoring people. Like, it, it, it's a challenge. And, and listen, if you know anything about the book of Romans, it's this great the, theological um, uh, book, the, the letter that, that Paul wrote inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's got this incredible uh, theology in there. And then he gets into the practical steps. And with all this theology, with all this information, with all these incredible things about justification, sanctification, glorification, all, the, all these things, he lands and says, with all that information, honor one another. That's what I'm calling you to do, to honor each other. This word, 
uh, th- this has such an incredible, transformative, and influential power in our life, this honor. Matter of fact, um, if you ever have relational conflict, if you ever have strife relationally with people, I would, I would dare to say that it has probably something to do with dishonor. Somebody didn't honor the other person. Somebody got hurt. Somebody got offended. They didn't feel honored. And so then, then now there's a conflict going on. So, so you know, the, the honor actually has a, a negative impact. It's, it's so transformative and influential, it can create a negative impact. But I'm telling you, those of you that, that, that have embraced this, man, when you actually bring honor into a marriage, when you bring honor into your relationship with your kids, when you bring honor in your relationship with your employer, with your friends, with church, it is transformative. It is so influential. Honor. How do we honor people in a cancel culture? How do we honor in a world that is so quick to dismiss everybody? And, and I would say this, is that before we start looking at the culture and what they need to do, we got to look inside here. We got to look at ourselves. We got to look at us as the church and say, how are we doing? How are we doing? How are we creating a culture of honor? in our homes, um, in our church. We're going to take a look at an incredible story this morning um, about honor. We're going to see how this um, has incredible, incredible impact. Let me um, uh, give you a definition of, of honor here real quick. Um, well, let me start with dishonor. Uh, dishonor means to treat as common or ordinary. Honor is to value, respect, or highly esteem to treat as precious, weighty, or valuable. Anybody want to be treated as precious, as weighty, as valuable? I think most, you know, I don't know about guys who want to be treated precious, but, um, but you know, most, you know, you want to be treated as valuable, right? So honoring someone is saying, I, I value you, I respect you, I, that you have a lot of weight, I'm going to treat you in that way, like, like, a, like a gem or like a, a, a real expensive dish, you know, like China. Um, I don't know if that's still a thing or not, but um, you, know, you, don't, you don't want to break it, right? You want to you treasure it. You, know, you treat China way different than you do just a paper plate, at least in theory. You're supposed to. So um, because of the value of the plate, it's still a paper plate, you still eat off of it, but one of them is different because of the, the value in it. But listen, God's saying, listen, we got to treat everybody like fine China. You've got to honor people in that way. And we've got to build one another up. We're building one another. We're steaming people. We're, we're encouraging people. We're respecting people. So if, the opposite, if that's honor, then the opposite is when we tear people down, we're dishonoring people. When we don't esteem people. So God's called us not to dishonor, but God's called us to, to honor people. Um, th- th- this is incredible. I have, I, we have in our, uh, it actually, I don't know what happened to it. It got stolen. But it, it's actually somewhere in my house. I don't know where it's at. Um, but I need to bring it back out. For years, it was out on the piano, and I'm not sure what happened to it. It was a chalkboard, and it's in our house, and, um, and I wrote three words on it like a number of years ago, and it's honor, truth, um, and grace. And um, I've always pointed my kids back to that chalkboard because they, they want to know the rules, right? And I always say, listen, if we do those three things, there are no rules. Think about it. If you're going to do something and, 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 and you're gonna, your family's about, I, whatever I'm doing, I'm going to make sure I honor my parents. I'm going to honor. It's good. Now, we're going to have boundaries, kid. I'm not saying that. But, um, but um, listen, a lot of friction and a lot of strife comes as a result of a lack of honor in relationships with one another. Uh, this story we're going to take a look at is a guy named King David. I'm sure you're familiar with him. In the Bible, he fought Goliath. A uh, little, uh, you know, in case you didn't know, he won. Um, and so um, you don't have to watch the movie. But uh, King David is a big deal in the Bible. So we're going to see an incredible story of him um, about how honor worked in his life and how honor didn't work in his life. And it's in First Samuel chapter 25. And before we do, I, you know, if y'all that hear me preach a lot, I like to bring a context. I like to kind of bring the backstory of what we're about, to, we're about to talk about. So what's amazing is when you actually look at uh, the preceding chapter, which would be chapter 24 because it's 25, and then the one after that would be 26. If you take all three of those things, they're all three dealing with a similar situation. And 24 and 26 have to do with David and the current king, Saul, who's trying to kill him. Okay, hello. David's the next king. He's already been anointed, but Saul's trying to kill him. And so you have 24 and 26, but in the middle is another story 
of David who actually responds in a different way than he does on these bookends of the story. But um, So you can kind of, you know, homework there if you want to take a look at those three stories. But I'm going to take two minutes right now and summarize chapter 24 because it's going to enhance the story that we're about to read in 25, okay? So um, King David, or David, he's already been anointed as king. Um, I know most of you are probably familiar with this story, but he, he's anointed as king. Uh, he fights Goliath, and um, uh, Saul is jealous. You know, he, he's, he's the insecure guy. He's jealous, and so eventually he wants to kill David. So David's on the run. David's on the run from Saul uh, because if the guy who's king of the country that you're in wants to kill you, you go and you run from him. So he's on the run. It's like a desert area. It's not a metropolitan area. And so um, he, he's, he's, they're hiding out in the wilderness area. And so he's got a few guys with him. David has some few men with him. But Saul's got like thousands of guys with him. And at one point, David and his guys are hiding in a cave. And Saul and his guy, uh, men stop because Saul's got to go to the bathroom. Okay? And so... Um, he actually stops at the cave that David's hiding in. Isn't that crazy? Like, how, how, how remarkable is that, you know? It's like, oh, I, you know, he just happens to step into the cave that David's in, okay? This, listen, he wants to kill David, okay? So David's in there. He's in a, uh, Saul, King Saul's in a vulnerable situation. He's uh, defenseless. And David's men are like, <laughs> God, it's good. Come on, man. I mean, we are getting out of here, man. I mean, I don't know if they did that, but, um, uh, you know, they're, they're like, I mean, just like God has just parted the Red Sea. This is a moment like he has put God, this guy right in your hands. Get him, David. Take him out, right? I mean, this is a God moment, you know? And so David gets up there, and he cuts off the corner of Saul's robe. And you all know the story. He's conscience stricken. And uh, in other words, God pricks his conscience, and he realizes um, he has a conviction about what he just did. And here's why. Because him cutting off the robe um, basically um, made King Saul um, outside of the regulations that he needed to be with the Torah as king. So when David cut off that corner of the robe, he's basically saying he's invalidating his kingship. You're not valid to be king. I'm the next king. I'm the one next on the throne. And basically David is taking things into his own hands. And God's like, no, no, no. Don't do that. So David... He's reminded about that. He's also reminded that God put Saul as king, and if God anointed David as king, he's going to make him king. He doesn't have to do it on his own. He can trust God with that situation. He also knows that Israel um, did not honor their leaders and, uh, and had a lot of problems, and God punished Israel as a result of that. So, he's like, so David's like, I'm going to make sure I honor the king. So this is unbelievable. I'm sure this hasn't happened to you, but... David goes out into outside the cave, gets on his knees, and honors Saul. Got the piece of the robe and says, look, I could have taken you out, and I didn't. I'm putting my hands in God's hands. Let God be the judge of us. And uh, Saul just sees his righteousness and is convicted and, and, and lets him go. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. That's how powerful honor is. L listen, he didn't steal his lunch. Saul wanted to kill him, and David honored him. Now, as great as that is, I don't know about you, but I, I can relate to the story because the next chapter, David just completely flips. You ever do it? You know, like you're like, man, everything's going great. I'm making a good decision. God's there, and all of a sudden, you're like, what did I just do? You know, like you know. So uh, David finds himself in a similar situation with a different person. He does not respond in that way, but the theme that we're seeing here is still this idea of honor. But God, but initially, chapter 24, David chooses to honor God by honoring his enemy. So this is chapter 25, verse 1. I'm going to read through this. We're going to point out to see a couple of things in here. And then I'm going to kind of land on basically some, uh, what the Bible says about like who to honor and, um, and stuff like that. So uh, chapter 1, or um, chapter 25, verse 1. Uh, now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him. And they buried him in the house at Ramah. Then David rose and went down to the wilderness in Paramp. Now, you might just read that right away and you say, okay, see, you died, okay, whatever. Uh, but usually when in the text, when, when they specify something, there's a reason why they put that in there. No, I mean, what was the reason why they put Samuel died? You know, he's dead, right? But um, the reason is, is Samuel's a big deal in Israel. 
Samuel was, uh, uh, if you know anything about the story of Israel and the story in 1 Samuel, that God raised up uh, Samuel as a prophet. And through Samuel, he anointed Saul as king, and now he anointed David as king. And the monarchy starts through Samuel. He's the voice of God. He's a prophet. He's a very highly revered person in Israel. He's also a mentor and a counselor for David. And it's interesting because now when he dies, David's on his own. He, doesn't have, he can't go to Samuel anymore. He can't get that counsel anymore. And he's somewhat vulnerable in that situation. And here's the first thing I want to mention to us about, um, about honor. Vulnerability makes us vulnerable to the temptation to dishonor. When you and I are vulnerable, when you and I are weak, when we have been hurt, when we have been rejected, that is fertile ground for the enemy to tempt you to dishonor somebody. And as we're going to see, you know, how the enemy works in, in his life. And we, it, it's helpful for us to be aware that in moments when we're weak, moments when my child has just went off the handle, or something with my spouse or, or with a coworker, people at church or whatever it is, that you gotta, we have to realize this. We've got to be wise. We've got to know. In that moment, that moment is the temptation to react. We gotta say, man, the enemy's trying to work in this right now. And he's gonna work when you and I are weak. He's gonna work when you and I are vulnerable. Okay? Uh, David is, is in a place of vulnerability, it's something new. And we're actually gonna see how he actually is dishonored and, and he has a, the, the wrong uh, reaction to this. So um, in, chapter, in verse two, here we go. Um, and there was a man in uh, Moen whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was sharing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the name of the man was uh, Nabel, the name of the, his wife, Abigail. Uh, the woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was uh, a Calebite. He's from the tribe of Caleb. So right away, you see this contrast between Nabel and, um, and Abigail. And, um, you know, Nabel sure does, doesn't that sound like Saul? He's harsh, badly behaved. His, actually, his name means fool. It means foolish. And so we have a foolish man. Uh, with a, um, a discerning and beautiful woman. Don't know if that, what that looks like in our life, but um, um, anyway, I missed that one. So, um, uh, so anyways, uh, you know, so it's, it's an amazing parallel between David and Saul and David and Baal. But David forgets. He forgets how he responded with Saul. So um, in this particular, as we're going on, David's men are need, and, uh, and uh, they hear that Nabal is shearing sheep, which is celebrated by feasting, so he knows that they're going to be eaten. And, uh, and so uh, they're in need of food. David's in the wilderness, so he's like, hey, we got to get something to eat. And so he's going to go and, and ask him, um, hey, can, can we have some food? So look, look in verse 4. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent ten young men, and David sent, said to the young men, go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house. And peace be to all you, to all that you have. Circle that word peace if you have your Bible. Three times that word uh, peace is mentioned because you're going to see that there's another word that's mentioned three times right after this. Uh, I'll get in that in a minute, but you can circle that word peace. So what is David? He's showing he's coming in shalom. He's coming in peace. He's coming to honor him, right? Um, and, uh, and so in verse 7, I hear that you have shears. Now, you have, now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them uh, no harm. And they missed nothing all the time they were in uh, Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have at, at hand to your servants and to your son David. So what's he saying? Like David's like, we protected all your shepherds out in the wilderness. There's bandits out there. There's people that can uh, mess with all their stuff. And so David, not that he was asked to, but just he, he's an honorable guy. And so he's like, hey, I'm going to protect all the, uh, your shepherd, make sure everything's good, and we didn't take anything. And so now he's going back to him. He's like, we have a need. Can you just... Get, pay us back for that, so to speak, right? And so, and he's being honorable about it. He's not, he's not um, uh, you know, uh, this isn't extortion or anything like that. And so, um, uh, so here in verse 9, when David's young men came, they said uh, all this to Nabal in the name of David, and, when they, and they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Okay, he's, he's insulting him, okay? He's dishonoring him. He said, there are many servants these days who are breaking away from
from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shears and give it to men who have come uh, from I do not know where? So David has protected this guy's stuff. And his response is rejection, it's an insult, and it's dishonoring to David. Let's look at what David does in response to that in verse 12. So David's young men turned away and came back and told him all this. And David said to his men, every man strap on his sword. Circle that word sword. You're going to see it three times. Um, sword. And every man, um, every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword. There's your three swords. And about 400 men went up after David while 200 uh, remained with the baggage. So what in the world's going on here? You see David come in peace, and now he's got a, he's got a sword. And he's going to go kill him. Why? Because he was dishonored. He was disrespected. You ever, you ever pick up a sword when you get dishonored and disrespected? Is that your mode? Listen, he honored the king who was trying to kill him. This guy just doesn't give him some food. And he's like, oh, you're, good. you're dead. Everybody's dead in your family. I mean, uh, you're like, what is going on, right? But, but listen, we could talk about honor all we want. But we got to talk about honor when you're dishonored. Because that's really, that's, that's, that's really where the rubber meets the road. We, we, we can honor people all day long. It's like, oh, great, you know. But as soon as somebody gets in my business, somebody, somebody does something and wrongs me, you know, um, it's, it's revenge time. It's, it's revenge time. And listen, that, that might be the cultural norm, but that's not the biblical norm. Revenge is a cultural norm, but that's not the biblical norm. Jesus never took out a sword. Just saying. I mean, he wasn't like, you know, uh, you know sitting down, eating with the, you know, the, the, the blind, the deaf, and the crippled, and somebody came in, take a knife, start chopping people. I mean, he didn't do that. He never beat up the Pharisees. Listen, I think this is so important today. Revenge is the cultural norm, but it is not the biblical norm. And listen, Christians, we have bought into a lie that it's okay to dishonor people if you disagree with them. It's okay to dishonor people if their life is different you know, than ours. Listen, the call to honor people has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. We honor people because God's called us to honor people. Matter of fact, in Romans 12, 17, it says this, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. I like how he brings getting, you know, your, your, evil's done to you, but that's contrast right there, okay? But give thought to what is honorable in sight of all. Doesn't mean you have to agree with people. Doesn't mean you can't state your case. You can't have, have your opinion or everything. But you do it in an honorable way. Honor them. Consider them weighty, precious China. I'm telling you, it'll change our relationship so much by doing this. Um, in verse 18, if possible, so far it is, depends on you. Live peaceably with all men. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Listen, David responded to Saul in, in, in the right way, but with Nabal, he's totally different. Totally respond. And again, I don't know if you can relate to that. I can, you know. Maybe today, everything's great at church. You're like, man, I feel so holy. You go to, and in like five minutes, you're at home. You're like, I'm in chapter 25. You know, like, um, you know, you just... Um, I don't know why, you know, um, the text doesn't say this, but, you know, this is what I, I got out of this, is this, that, um, you know, why did David respond to Saul that way, other than he was conscience was pricked and God's taken to him, but, you know, where was his conscience with this guy, this other guy, right, this wealthy guy? And, you know, I, I always think through, like, well, Saul was king, right? This guy's just a, you know, he's got guys shearing sheep, you know, wealthy guy, but he's not really much 
And, you know, honor should be given regardless of status. I don't know, you ever done that before? You ever honor people based on their status? You know, based on their wealth? Because this is more important. The person that has billions of dollars is no more important than the person on the side of the street. So David withholds honor and he's seeking revenge. But this is so awesome because God intervenes. This is so awesome. God intervenes. And he's going to show David how he should respond through uh, Nabal's wife, Abigail. Look in verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master. And he rallied at them, or railed at them. Uh, Yet the men were very good to us, and we suffered no harm, and we did not miss anything when we were in the field. So as long as we went with them, they were uh, were a wall to us. In other words, they, they were protecting us, to us both by night and by day. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore, know this and consider what you should do. For harm is determined against our master and against all this house, and he is such a worthless man that one cannot speak to him. You know, foolish people are people you can't talk to. Foolish people are people you can't reason with. Well, a wise person is, is, is someone who's a very good listener. Foolish people just want to talk the whole time. Um, verse 18, uh, then Abigail, I mean, this, this, she's awesome here, okay? So, um, then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two skins of wine and five sheep already prepared and five sets of parched grain and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on donkeys. It's a lot. Um, and she said to her young men, go on there before me. Behold, I come after you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal, and she rode on the donkey and came down under cover of the mountain. Behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Listen, this is pretty bold and courageous of what she's about to do, right? Um, she's going to try to save her, save her family, save her husband. Um, in verse 21, now David had said, surely in vain I've guarded all that, um, that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he's returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David, and more also if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. He's, he's kind of upset. He's a little bothered by what just happened, right? I'd say so. Um, and I like, he's like this fella, you know? I did all this for him. You ever been like that? You know, I did this for her. I did this for him. You know, what, you know I, what, what do I get in return? Verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. Man, she starts honoring him. She fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. Let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow. Nabal. Okay, she, okay, he's not... You know, she says he's worthless, but, um, you know, um, she, you know, look, his name means fool. So, um, uh, um, for his, um, this worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and father is with him. But I am your servant, do not see the young men of my Lord. You should read the, this and just circle every time you see my Lord, how much she's um, put, positioning herself in a place of humility and uh, esteeming him. She's calling herself a, his servant, calling him my Lord. I'm not saying that you need to call your husband or your wife, my Lord, but, um, um, you know, uh, but she's putting herself in a, in a place of humility. And if you want to honor people, that, that's what we do. We put our place in a, in, a, in, a, in a position of humility. And let me say this. How do we honor? This is just, I'll just interject this. Uh, I think one of the most powerful ways we honor people is by the what we say to them and how we say it to them. And we live in times like, well, I'm just going to say what I want to say, you know? And we might say absolute truth, but completely dishonor and disrespect the person that we're talking to. A wise person is going to be careful with their words and honor that person with what they say. You see that she's just the, the words that she's saying. She's not only physically down on her knees, but just she, she's given him honor with her mouth, with, with the words that she says. Um, now then, my Lord... Um, I forgot where I was, so, um, but I'm just going to start in verse 26. Um, 
Now then, my Lord, as the Lord lives as your, um, and as your soul lives, because the Lord has restrained you from blood guilt and from saving with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek to do evil to my Lord uh, be as Nabal. I'm just going to keep reading. Uh, and now let this present that your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your servant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil should not be found in you so as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living in the care of the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies shall be sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the, uh, all the good that has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience. I love this, verse 31. My Lord shall have no cause of grief of pain or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause um, or for my Lord working salvation himself. Listen, what is she saying? Remember in the previous story, God, uh, David's conscience was stricken? She's like, listen, God is intervening here. He's working through me right now because you can now look back and you cannot have a guilty conscience for what happened. And how many times do we wish we could go back to a moment and think, what is the story that we want to tell in that moment? I wish I could change the decision because in that moment, most of us don't want to go back and say, I've got a story to tell of my revenge, of my anger. But listen, what is the story that we want to tell? What is the legacy we want to leave for our kids, for, for our grandkids? When you're in a moment and you're vulnerable, to stop and think, what is the story I want to tell? Is, it, is the story that David wants to tell that I got to the kingship through bloodshed? Or the story you want to tell is I got through the kingship through honor and humility. For us to stop and think through that when we're in those moments. What is the story I want to tell? I got to where I am because God is faithful. Because God made a way. Uh, just in this story here, and David um, said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. So he, he, he's, he sees her righteousness. He sees her wisdom. And uh, I'm not going to read the rest of the story. Um, but he sees her, her wisdom and discretion and, and lets her go. She goes back home. The bell's drunk. Um, and then he eventually dies, like, pretty soon after that. So, um, and then David marries Abigail. Whatever. You know, so they, you know, happy married, you know, I don't know the love story there, but, um, <laughs> but, but here's the thing is like, David listened, David listened to her, her wisdom, and she was a picture of what he was supposed to be doing. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to see him honor Saul in the next chapter, but it's interesting, these, these three, these three chapters in the bookends, he's honored, in the middle one, he's, he's, he's missing it, Right? And listen, maybe you're in a, feel like you're in the middle of, of bookends right now. And listen, there's another chapter. There's another chapter for you. So this incredible story of, 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 of the path that God has laid out for the kingship of King David. And listen, the path for you and I as followers of Christ is a path of humility, and it's a path of honor. To honor those. To outdo one another with honor. Not that they deserve it. Not that they've done anything to achieve it. They might have wronged you, but you can still honor them in a way that pleases God. Let me give us a couple of uh, what the Bible says about honor um, uh, in the New Testament here. I got one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Five years. Five and a half years of college. So um, uh, the first one is um, uh, the first one is honor God. Uh, first thing is there to honor God. And I think there's a verse coming up here. Um, in Proverbs three, there it is. Um, honor the Lord your wealth, uh, the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. You know, for, you know, first thing you need about honor is we need to honor God. Everything else needs to stem from this idea that we need to honor God. And you know, one of the ways we honor God is we honor God with our money. God says, bring the first fruits in. Honor me with what you have. That's how we. That's how we need to um, honor God. We're going to talk more about that um, in the next few weeks. Uh, but we need to honor God. Everything needs to stem from honoring God. David's his response to Saul, it's about rooted in this idea that I'm going to honor him, but I'm going to do it because I'm honoring God. Second thing is honor parents. Every parent here knows this verse, right? 
Um, and it actually processes adults too. Like it, it doesn't say once you grow up, you don't need to honor your parents anymore. Actually, it, this is for anybody that's a child. Verse 2 of Ephesians 6, honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. That it go, may, may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Man, how important it is for, to teach our kids honor. And not just to teach your kids honor, but to show them honor. There, there, when I was a youth pastor um, years ago, um, some actually people in the church were out to, I was out to lunch with them, some people are here today. And um, we were at Chili's. And uh, one of the kids, uh, one of the, da- the da- dads was sharing a story about his kids. And his son was in middle school. And uh, his son kind of stopped him and said, um, hey, don't share that story. I know you're very apparent. You're like, oh, it's, it's okay, you know, right, right, and share it. And I'll never, I'll, I'll never forget this moment, sitting across from him and watch that dad say, oh, never mind, he don't want me to share it. I thought, man, he just honored him. This dad just honored his son. Let me tell you, I've got a bunch of stories about that son honoring his dad. But I thought, man, he, he, didn't, he wasn't just telling him what to do. He was actually showing him what honor was. We, we need to show our kids what honor is. Um, next thing is um, honor our spiritual leaders. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, that might be self-serving here, and I'm not trying to, you know, I didn't want to put that up there, but then I put it up there because I didn't want to put it up there. Um, but, um, you know, um, so... Um, <laughs> But, um, but I'll say this, elders in the church, honor, honor those people, honor people that teach, honor people on staff. We should honor our children's ministers. We should honor our worship leader. We should honor uh, you know, people in our church. That, that, that those, those are people that God says, honor these people that are investing their life in the church. Uh, next thing is marriage. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Man, isn't it, don't we need to honor marriage? To, 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 you know, in a, in a, it's so messed up today, but we've got to start in the house of God, right? How do we honor marriage? Honor our spouse. Honor our husband. Last thing is in here. Everybody's going to be excited about this one. Um, honor authority. Let every person be subject to the growing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. I, I was joking around when I said that, but the reality is this. Um, there's probably, there could be somebody that's in office right now that you don't want in office. God's called you to honor him. You can disagree with every single thing under the sun. But we're called to honor people. We got to be different. We got to be different. Um, there's a, um, a story of, um, I'm going to close on this story here, is um, Babe Ruth. I don't know if you ever heard of him, baseball player. So um, he had a lot of home runs. So he signed a bunch of stuff. Well, he apparently signed seven bats. Seven. And for years, one of them has been missing. So there's seven, so there'd be six that they have. So there's one missing. And um, this guy that had it for years, um, had nobody in his family, you know, to pass it along. They didn't know where the bat was or whatever. And um, uh, there was a nurse, Marcia, that cared for him for years. And so when he was passing away, um, he gave her a bat signed by Babe Ruth. She don't know much about it, you know. Stayed underneath her bed for 18 years. 18 years. Um, so she eventually, I guess, retires from nursing, and she wants to start a restaurant. She doesn't have any money. She's like, I wonder what this thing under the bed is, this bat, you know. So um, uh, she takes it to a memorabilia store, and the guy's just flipping out. So let me see this. Um, and uh, this is actually the bat. I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Yeah. Um, it's actually got my name on it, so, uh, which is not worth anything like that. But um, um, actually, this is actually a bat the church gave me um, in 2014. Um, and so um, 
uh, and so she took the bat, and you know, they they went and found out that here's the missing bat. I think she sold it in auction for like 1.4 million dollars. And uh, listen, that bat was probably worth five dollars, twenty dollars. I don't know, but listen, the name on that bat made all the difference. So she knew that Babe Ruth, um, I think he was an uh, orphan, so he, um, but she knew he cared for, for kids and orphans, so she actually took a number of that, uh, the proceeds of that money and, uh, and to give uh, in his honor um, to kids that were, um, uh, there were orphans. And, uh, and this is the quote that she gave, because um, everybody's like, what are you doing? Why are you giving all that money away? And she said, the bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth was name on it. Since he had made it valuable, the only reasonable thing that I could do was something that would honor his life. Listen, you carry the name of God. You are created in the image of God. As a Christian, you bear the name of Jesus. The reasonable thing to do would be to honor him. To honor him with your life. We honor God by honoring other people. He gave his life for us, sacrificed his life for us, and, and it says in, in Philippians 2 that God gave him the name that is above every other name. The name of Jesus is above every other name and is bearers of his name. As it says in Colossians, to do everything in the name of Jesus. The, honor, the reasonable thing is to do is to us to honor him and give our life to him. To honor God with what we do. To honor God with our relationships. To honor God with everything we do. You know, it says in, in the Gospels how um, Jesus couldn't do miracles in one particular spot. And it says a prophet is not, um, um, uh, a prophet is not honored in his hometown. And he's in his hometown. And he's in the, the proverb there, you know, a uh, 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 prophet is not honored in his own town. And, you know, they're lacking faith associated with that. And it's like I wonder sometimes if maybe God's not moving in our life because we have no honor. You know, church, we, we, you know, let's honor God. And I'm not saying we don't, but let, let's come together. Let's honor God. Let's honor God with our relationships. Let's honor God with what he's given us. And maybe you're here this morning. I don't know where you're at this morning, but maybe you're like, hey, I need to turn from what I'm doing. I need to turn towards somebody. I need to ask somebody for forgiveness. I need, I need to, to, to restore something. This is an opportunity for us to just to respond to God to do that. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to, Oliver's going to play for us right now. And we're just going to have a moment. And if uh, you'd like prayer for anything or you'd like to pray with somebody in here, um, this is just an opportunity for us to respond to God. Respond to what he's done for you and I.